there are consistent and decent profits which uh, which is the reason why private uh, entities are there yeah and they are also there because there is a gap because there are not enough tertiary care centers there are not enough uh, government hospitals uh, there are not enough uh, government infrastructures and manpower to deal with the huge disease burden we have across uh, socio economic strata so as i told earlier you have an entire spectrum of hospitals uh, which treat these patients and these private entities and corporate entities are there uh, because the gaps exist yeah. and obviously they are making use of that gap and they are providing service yeah. i mean they are providing service it's not that they are just making profit they are filling a huge gap in healthcare which would have been otherwise uh, untenable mm. but they do make profits uh, so so when when people come to these hospitals either they have to have some scheme which covers them or they have to have money or they have to have uh, good enough insurance uh, which can help them uh, get treatment uh, okay. whether it uh, it is difficult for a doctor not really because the doctors uh, most doctors work in these hospitals yeah. uh, for a salary and they provide services the profits are not really made by the doctors Right. Uh, the doctors are just providing service to the best of their ability because they have the infrastructure they have the manpower they don't have to worry about those things which you have to say in a government hospital if i am operating in a government hospital uh, not all but most of them i'll be worried about where are my instruments uh, what will i need whether i have everything uh, required for this procedure whether i have an adequate manpower to take care of this patient post operatively all those will be on my head whereas in a corporate hospital i do not have those worries because i know that these are taken care of and i can do the best of my um, effort and uh, yeah th- that is That's where stressful though right imagine thinking okay i'm going to do the best i can i'm medically trained to do this but is there a nurse who's going to show up is there you know is there going to be enough equipment for post care is there enough hygiene which another secondary infection that's very yeah. stressful situations to work within true i mean all all my colleagues who work in government setups in government hospitals mm-hmm. uh, be it smaller district level hospitals or uh, higher level hospitals tertiary hospitals they have to work uh, i would say three times harder than me uh, doing it at a corporate hospital yeah. uh, because they have to worry about everything uh, even mm-hmm. residents who are training in these centers because i myself have trained in uh, SMS Medical College Jaipur there is right. a huge burden of patients a huge amount of responsibility and things not as freely available as in a uh, corporate hospital to do your work so uh, government doctors whoever are doing uh, across different levels of care they are doing a fantastic job under the uh, existing circumstances and the system is holding on because of the hard work of these doctors and nurses and technicians who work in these hospitals and the residents who are training there and the medical students and interns otherwise it would have been a very difficult system to you know, stand up even for a day and are the medical uh, supplies the drugs the the procedures are they all the same or is there a disparity there as well between private and government uh, there will be a disparity because in government hospitals most often the uh, care is either free or subsidized right. uh, so they cannot really have the luxury of uh, using as many consumables as many disposables uh, and uh, uh, the advanced medication and uh, stuff what i would use in a private hospital so right. they have to work under certain limitations uh, use and make do with the basic minimum and not really look at uh, high end uh, disposables and uh, uh other stuff you plus know, doctor, manpower of course of course right no because you know we saw of course the it makes sense you know i i i didn't ask the question saying to demonize uh corporatization of healthcare but uh, we saw the the important statement you said which is it fills a big gap and it fills a thing which uh is needed and of course people use that need uh and address that need and the people go and use those services but we saw we, we we you know we were given a glimpse of how much pressure the entire healthcare system hospital system came during covid of course the the nursing staff the 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 post that fungal infection certain other disease secondary infections um how well prepared are we for a public health crisis in india right now i would say we have learned a lot after mm-hmm. covid covid was a right. big a huge learning experience uh within a gap of two year a span of two years Uh, there was exponential learning at the nursing level at the 
administration level at the doctor level mm-hmm. uh, how to deal with these uh, patients uh, how when to admit when not to admit for example in the first wave almost mm-hmm. everybody who was covid positive was admitted yeah yeah whether they needed it or not but then when the second wave hit as we knew that uh, everybody doesn't need admission you, it's only the sick patients who need to be admitted yeah. we learned quickly but uh, i would say india as a country uh, there may be criticism there are a lot of drawbacks Uh, there have been deaths but for a population like india with the existing uh, uh, health infrastructure at government and other levels and private entities india managed covid pretty well as a doctor this is not something um, i would i would just say most of my colleagues in government and other hospitals would agree that india dealt with covid much effectively than anybody had thought even we doctors i don't think expected that as a country we will do uh, The, the way we did uh, beat uh, vaccination we taking care of patients of course there were problems there was a crisis for beds there was a crisis for icus there was a crisis for oxygen but despite all that as a country we did well and uh, and the country is now prepared better i would say mm. uh, in future if there are uh, such emergencies as a country we are much uh, well equipped right. and i'm sure the government as well as health authorities Uh, have learned their lessons and those will be utilized in future mm-hmm. when such uh, health crisis will be there no that's that's no i mean of course you know the thing there is a lot of again miss uh, representation of how things were you know because it's so easy to rant on a tweet or a whatsapp group saying oh this this hospital turned us away or this uh, uh, there, there's an appropriate misappropriation of oxygen tanks so you hear all this so it's good like that that someone like you who's in the heart of it in the, in the thick of things to give a clear explanation because these things need to be dispelled at a level which is uh, only possible when someone is so involved in a, as a doctor like you and someone who's got the expertise um i i heard see, a see as a country as a country i would like to add mm-hmm. when it comes to healthcare data is something india is not very strong with yeah it is not only with covid even before covid Right. if you ask for any data for example how many heart attacks happen in india in a year right how many angioplasties are done in a year how many uh, say uh, cancer diagnosis is done in a year it is very difficult to get these data mm-hmm. how many deaths happened due to uh, heart attacks in a year because mm-hmm. our reporting system our death certification these are all not computerized completely uh, so, right. some parts of it are still working manual level so there is a lo- lot of uh, under diagnosis under reporting over reporting so our data is not really strong computerization has to happen more aggressively in the healthcare segment across primary secondary and tertiary care levels and we need to have more data then when the pandemic like covid is there we'll also have better data to say how many patients actually died how many patients uh, actually were hospitalized so it is all from different sources so mm-hmm. for me to vouch and say okay this is what it is is not very diff- it's it's not very easy yeah 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 no, but of course you're speaking from what you have witnessed in your hospital yes, which is yes. the best you can do in a in, in in a system which is not very well documented right but um doctor i want to just uh, i have a couple of things i want to ask i think the first thing i i i, I want to address is i heard the statement which is a sick population is a profitable population um so based on that statement how sick or healthy is the average uh indian <laughs> if that's even as uh if it's too vast a question please um let me know and i can try to make it more specific but see india 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 as i told you uh has a diverse population you right. have on one end uh people who have uh, reached a good socio economic uh, uh level mm-hmm. where they do not suffer from basic uh, infectious diseases right. uh, they do not suffer from malnutrition where they do not suffer from starvation uh, they suffer from uh, lifestyle related diseases take for right. example smoking uh, diabetes hypertension heart disease uh, and on the other hand you do have uh, poor people uh, who do suffer from malnutrition who do suffer from infectious diseases there are still cases of malaria there are cases of dengue uh, there are cases of starvation you have both ends of the spectrum in india and everything in between 
So let's talk as a cardiologist because I know it's a vast question. As a cardiologist, yeah. as a cardiologist, heart health in comes to a middle class to the growing population, which seems to be more affluent, which everyone talks about in studies, saying the Indian middle class has more purchasing power. You see a lot more of them traveling internationally. You see a lot of them uh, who have a little better. And sorry for interrupting, but I, 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 because you're a cardiologist, you specifically work in this yeah. space. How is this population's heart health uh, going? Um, in present day 2023 so as a ethnic group mm -hmm. indians are at the highest risk of developing heart disease okay. among the entire world population indians are as they are at the highest risk as a ethnic group okay. because of genetic reasons uh, and other reasons uh, so india is already the diabetes capital of the world right and more, uh, apart from diagnosed diabetes diseases, diabetes uh, cases, we also have a huge number of pre-diabetics and undiagnosed diabetics among our population. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, we also have a huge burden of known and unknown cardiac cases in our population. As mm -hmm. a cardiologist, uh, I see a huge number of heart patients, hypertensives, diabetics, people having high cholesterol. And as I told Indians, have the highest risk of developing heart disease among various ethnic groups. Uh, smoking is also pretty reasons, high. Doctor, before we talk about the lifestyle things, what is there the are various thing? there are various theories for the increased susceptibility of Indians to heart disease. Mm -hmm. One being that we are prone to develop abdominal obesity. Mm -hmm. So even with a little bit of over overeating, we develop a tummy, and that tummy will be our undoing because uh, abdominal obesity is one of the major risk factors for insulin resistance, diabetes, and heart disease. Right. There are various theories. Uh, some of the theories are that as a population, we have gone through several uh, starvation episodes, several uh, uh, years of drought, mm -hmm. uh, and then come out of it. That is one of the reasons. Indian it body as such... the food. Yes, hoard food. And when, when refeeding happens, there is uh, fat deposition in the body. We very easily convert excess calories into fat and which tends to get stored in the abdomen right. and as a result leading to insulin resistance. The other being uh, even with small increases in calorie intake, we tend to uh, put on weight, uh, especially around the abdomen and uh, leading to obesity and diabetes and with lesser amounts of intake of uh, carbohydrates and fats, we tend to become more uh, obese faster right. than say a Caucasian or somebody else would. There is right. something called the jumping gene hypothesis, uh, starvation hypothesis, drought hypothesis, whatever the reasons, uh, basic fact remains that even with a little overeating and a little sedentary lifestyle, we accumulate a far amount of cardiac risk compared to other ethnicities. Okay. So we need to be extra careful with our diet and exercise and lifestyle. Right. And the thing is, see, over the past now 20 years, we see more Indians who are uh, who are not worried about the next meal. I can't, of course, talk about, can't generalize. We do, as you said, have a huge uh, diversity in that population. Maybe you have someone who's flying caviar for their next meal versus someone who can't even afford uh, the basic rations, right? So I, I, I can't yeah. generalize in a population like ours. But uh, again, let's the, the population that you do, you do see uh, in Bangalore is, um, again, diverse, but there is a chance that they are more leaning towards, okay, they can get two meals a day. Uh, and now with this abundance of food in for some populations, in the next 30 years, will you see some of this scarcity uh, mindset and as a result, the, the genes manifesting in a form where we don't um, have this, this, this tendency to uh, develop such um, drastic results from low feeding or from little excess eating? Yeah. Uh, see, uh, all countries... Uh, go through these phases of diseases, right. like the US and Europe have gone through these phases where, had, where they had a peak of uh, heart diseases, heart attacks, bypass surgeries, and angioplastics, mm -hmm. and now they have plateaued out. Right. India is still on the upward part of the graph, mm -hmm. where case numbers are increasing. At some point, it will plateau out as right. the society uh, advances uh, through times. But yes, as I told you, we have different spectrum of people. Uh, in the same thing. We have people who are starving, we have people who are overfeeding and overeating. Yeah. So they will all be at different parts of the curve. But you will see those people who's, whose socioeconomic conditions are improving, developing these problems in the next 10 to 20 years. Mm. 
So it's like you break out from one group, you escape one set of diseases, and you yes. enter the next. Yeah. So you know, many people are proud when 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 I say India is developing, they're like, no, you can't say that. We are, or if I say India is underdeveloped, we'll say, how dare you, right? It almost becomes a patriotic issue when it clearly seems like the signs are re- there to see not in our GDP but in our population, in the health of a population. So yeah. how far are we from getting some sense of escaping? from the underdeveloped status as a country to some level of okay that there's a general level of basic health in india i would say at least we are uh, two decades away from that okay so about 20 years from yeah. being considered as generally uh, yes. a level of basic health okay, okay. Yeah, and even the healthcare structures to mm-hmm. mature and reach that level where uh, you have a fairly decent coverage for the entire population i think it will take another 15 to 20 years okay so that I mean, it's promising. It's not. It's not great, but it's at least on on the horizon, right? Yeah. Um, as long as we are improving and not deteriorating, it's always better. Let's yeah. Let's try staying positive, right? Because there is that that tendency, or that there is that possibility as well. 